Do you want me to share my screen right away? Uh, just a second. Could you repeat that? So you want to test your... No, it will work. I have never known it to fail in the last three years. <laughs> Yes, but your microphone is not very audible to me. I can almost make out what you're saying. Because actually the laptop microphone is picking up from the speaker on your room. It's not picking up from your microphone. So if you speak into the laptop, it will be far more clear. So now, so this is better. Or is it going to be better? Okay, I'm sharing my screen, so I think you should be able to see my screen. Yes, I, I am. I have shared my screen. So now, can you hear me? Yes. Is it fine, sir? Yes. I welcome everyone to the fourth session of the two day international seminar in technology for environmental sustainability, socio economic responsibility, and associated entrepreneurial opportunities in society and rural environment. This session will be chaired by Dr. Sony Rastogi, Professor in Yorubindo College. We have four speakers in this technical session. They are Professor Samrat Kar, Professor Ava Mishra, Professor Praveen K. Varma, and Professor Praveen Kumar, who will be joining us through the Zoom platform. I would now request Professor Sony Rastogi to take over the session. Thank you, Shikhar. Good morning, everyone. A first speaker for this session is Professor Subra Kaur. So, we extend a very warm welcome to you on behalf of the Orlando College on the occasion of this international seminar. Professor Subra Kaur graduated with honors in physical and electronic engineering from the Buddha Institute of Technology and Science, Telangana. He holds a doctoral degree in electrical communication engineering from the Indian Institute of Science and Law. He has been with the International Center for Theoretical Physics Theatre as a postdoctoral fellow. Currently, he is a professor at the Department of Electrical Engineering at IIT Delhi. He holds the esteemed Ram and Sita Sabnani Chair Professorship at IIT Delhi and his research areas are in optical communication, switching, access technology, telecom protocol, related systems, and IT network. Professor Subra Kaur will give a talk on Internet of Things. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, and a very good morning to all of you. My 
topic is about a old old subject which has been made new in the recent years uh, this subject is nearly half a century old uh, but unfortunately thanks to the newspaper journalists and the newspaper articles and uh, people who make buzzwords their uh, the cause of their professional lives this particular word has become something which something to celebrate recently but it is not something recent it is it is very very as old as uh, thousands of years actually for instance a caveman who looked at his fire going down and blew into it to make it start up again was actually doing a control system and looking at an internet of five places so really speaking it is as old as a neanderthal man's existence but that is not the iot we understand right the iot we understand is a method for uh, by the way just just to interrupt how many how much time do i have do i have 15 minutes or half an hour or one hour Hello. Thirty minutes. I have thirty minutes. Yes, sir. Thirty okay. minutes. Okay, good. Good. That's that's more than enough. Um. So this this particular word is all about how smart sensors allow us. Yeah. Yes. Uh, i think you can turn up the laptop uh, speaker or something like that because i am pretty close to my microphone now okay all right so smart sensors allow us to sense most physical aspects of our time, life for instance a physical aspect of our life could be temperature could be pressure could be the weight of something could be the existence of something could be the location of something so they allow physical systems to be controlled by cyber systems by which i mean the control part of the physical systems the cyber system is usually a computer but not necessarily a computer right so we both sense and we control through an actuator whatever space we live in right? and this this sounds extremely abstract so let me give you a story to make it a little less abstract maybe i'll come to the story one or two slides later but let me let me uh pray just put this on the uh on the screen to show you that the word internet of things was invented as many words are invented as a spur of the moment thing so in 1999 right uh, if you read his book kevin ashton uh, added the word internet to a presentation he was making to executives at procter and gamble right and the and the proposal the presentation he was making was to put rfid chips on products to track them through a supply chain this essentially means that if you have a vaccine which is made in let's say pune and is coming to let's say a hospital in bihar you have an rfid which tells you where is it at what temperature is it if anybody opened the box and took out some vaccine and added some vaccine so throughout the supply chain from the point of manufacture to the point of consumption kevin ashton proposed to put rfid chips so that you could see where your consignment was now in today's world this is not very this is very very normal and common you see because amazon deliveries big basket deliveries are part of our lives we do not think this is something magical but in 1999 it was pretty magical because internet itself was magical so to catch the attention of the executives you know executives are notoriously difficult to um, capture their minds wander at the least least excuse like like principals of colleges vice chancellor of universities they have attention spans of minutes 
right? So if you are to catch their attention, you must add some buzzwords. So he added the word internet. Um, he was really making a tracking system. But the internet of things came from this particular presentation because he wrote, later wrote a paper on it, right? Saying this, we could actually track things and instead of just being an internet of computers, which is what we knew as the internet, the DARPA net, he said, well, everything can be on the internet, right? And since then, people, people's imagination has caught on and expanded the word thing to internet of everything. So we, we now say the internet of everything, the internet of everything is something which is about people, it's about things, right? It's about data, it is about processes, right? So that's what we call the internet of everything. And when you have the internet of everything, right? Imagine, you just imagine that you are now attending the seminar and some of you are sitting on chairs, some of you are sitting on sofas, and each of you has a particular way of flopping down on the chair when you sit. Some people sit very guardedly. Some people just throw themselves down. Some people crash on the chair. So everybody's way of sitting is a signature of that somebody. So suppose I could install a sensor just below your chair, take the output of that sensor through a network. I'm not specifying which network, maybe RF, maybe Wi-Fi, maybe Bluetooth, maybe optics, right? And I could just say that the head of the department is currently occupying a chair in room number so-and-so in building number so-and-so, and that's the location. And let's say I could add it to her website or his website. Then you know the website of the particular individual would reflect where he or she was and which row and which chair, right? Now that's, that's a people thing to do, to track this person. Now, there are, there are many pros and cons to this. You can say that, oh, that's a great way to know where the head is. So if I want a paper signed, I just have to rush to room number so-and-so, chair number so-and-so, and whoever is sitting in that chair, I just say, sign it, you are the head. That's one way. The other way is that this is an intrusion on my privacy. Who told you to tell the world that I'm sitting in this chair in this room? That's another way of looking at it. But that's a people thing. So you've added people to things by sensing their way of sitting, not just their weight, not just their fingerprint, their method of crashing onto a chair. Their method of getting up from the chair also is an equally valid signature. So you can make that also your, your principle, your sensing modality. That was just a story. But it tells you that, okay, useful things certainly seem possible if this happens. I'm going to put a diagram and I'm going to tell you another story. Now, this is the diagram which you can pull off the internet. And this just puts in one, one picture the elements of an internet of everything. So there are there are people here. Right? Let me let me see if I can put the pointer. Okay. So there are people here, there are things here. There is data here and they are connected. The, the process is in the middle. So people talk to things, things talk to data, people generate data and talk to data. But sometimes people communicate to people. That's P2P, P2P. Sometimes machines talk and generate data. So that's M2M. So a machine takes some data and sends it to another machine. So that is M2M. And sometimes people talk to machines, right? Which is P2M. Then there are processes in between. Like for instance, uh, when you have data, you can post process the data and call it big data or data analytics. The entire science of data science is about this. Between these two things, there are sorts of connections. There could be Bluetooth connections, there could be Wi-Fi connections, there could be post connections, there could be offline connections, right? But what does this story tell? Where is the story behind this? I mean, anybody who has access to the internet has access to this diagram, but where is the story behind this? 
stories are great things. They, they allow us to understand at a pinch what diagrams cannot explain. Let's assume that there is a city. In today's, today's dictionary, I suppose I would call it a smart city. Right? And let's assume I live in a smart city. So in this smart city, I get up in a smart apartment. So that's, that's an apartment which has smart elements in it. Uh, I'm not spelling out the smart elements, but you could, you could add a smart to anything in the apartment and make it smart. For instance, smart fridge, smart door, smart oven, smart uh, heater, smart air conditioner. But in this smart apartment, I, the user of this smart city, get up. So when I get up, my getting up must be sensed by a liveness sensor. What is a liveness sensor? Now, a liveness sensor could be as, as high resolution as checking my heartbeat, looking at my pulse, checking whether I'm sweating, am I breathing? This is a very high resolution way of testing whether I'm alive. But you could also say that if I'm moving, I must be alive. So moving is a substitute for heartbeat, blood pressure, sweat, fingerprint. So if I get up from my bed and sit up, I think my apartment knows that I am alive and moving, right? So what should my apartment do as a reaction to my getting up? Well, you can imagine it because this world and this decade are unique. They don't, they, they don't pose big difficulties to imagining what next, because we say, all right, I'm going to get the newspaper, but I am going to I am going to actually uh, read the newspaper and I probably will read it on my smartphone. But then my apartment could sense that my display element, my plasma TV, right, which is a high resolution plasma TV is the thing which I can read most conveniently. I don't have to reach for my smartphone. So it opens my newspaper on my TV as I look at my TV. So you have to have a look sensor, something which senses my eyes as I look at the TV and puts newspapers and I can talk to my TV. Now, talking to my TV in 1990 was very futuristic. But this is the world of Alexa. Right? So each of us know what uh, Alexa is, what Siri is, um, and uh, I've forgotten what the Google equivalent of Alexa is, but there is a Google equivalent of Alexa. And you can just say open newspaper and it just opens a newspaper and it's very common. I mean, children sort of know and accept this, but in 1980, it would be magic. But let's say I can say open the Times of India on page three and let me see the cartoon strip on Times of India, which is where I start. Now that could easily be done on my TV, but what comes next is more important. As I walk past my TV and pick up my toothbrush and vanish into the bathroom, the TV switches off and only maintains audio because it now knows that I'm not looking at it. So why waste power? So that's smart, right? Now smartness therefore means giving my TV the sensors to sense whether I am breathing, looking, walking past it, in front of it, behind it, in the bathroom. So this is, this is connectedness. So if my bathroom door is designed to sense that I walk through it, then it should tell my TV that he's in the bathroom now. You better switch off your picture, right? It looks idiotic for you to keep on playing a news reel when he's not watching it. Smart, very smart. But it gets smarter because the story gets smarter. So I brush my teeth and, and naturally I do a lot of things like opening my smart fridge, uh, opening my smart milk tetra pack, pouring myself a coffee cup, which my smart oven then heats to my preferred temperature, et cetera, et cetera. These are all very, very routine, smart things which we meet in newspaper articles, um, pundits on TV and BTEC projects and Google projects. These are all very routine things now. This, this, this is no longer even qualifying as smart, right? There used to be a time when if my fridge could order milk when I ran out of milk, 
I would say, oh my God, that's smart. A fridge, self-ordering milk and deducting the amount from my bank, that is smart. But today I'm not surprised. I say, well, fine, I paid 30,000 rupees extra for just, just this feature. So what's so great about it? We are a world of QR code, smartness, connectedness. That is not so smart for us. But look at what is coming next. So I pick up my smart briefcase, which by sensing the way I picked it up, opens and allows me to put my day's um, devices in it. I'm not saying my day's papers in it, because I might not have papers to carry to office. But my Kindle, my laptop, my iPad, my so-and-so, my so-and-so, my so-and-so into my smart briefcase. And then I walk out of my apartment. Then it's time for some greater magic, bigger magic. When I walk out from my apartment, somebody should sense, something should sense, something should sense that I am no longer in my apartment. What is that thing? It could be my smart door. <clears throat> a smart door which knows whether I went out of it or I came into it. Now, if I went out of it and locked it, it should now tell people, tell, tell things, other things. For instance, it should tell my power supply company that he is not in his apartment anymore. So if you want, you can actually reduce the voltage to his house by, let's say, 100 volts. You brown out his house. We all know that browning out saves power. But you can't brown, a, brown out an apartment when I'm inside it. But what when I'm not inside it? Well, if my profile allows it, you can brown out my apartment when I'm not inside it. Any advantage to such smartness? Well, yes. Assume that you are in a community where there are 400 people or 400 families. 400 families is about 2,000 people. It's about, about apartments. So if you can brown out 400, maybe 350 out of 400 apartments, just because I'm not in them, you have a major power saving feature in your, in your armory, right? You can brown out portions of the city which are residential because people are not in that house at that moment and give that power to somebody else who needs it. Maybe a factory, maybe an office, right? So you see, I can actually make my power move along with me as I move from home to the factory, but the magic is not over. The elements of IO, IOE have still not exist, exhausted themselves. As I step out of the house, you know that the government runs buses as per a schedule. It doesn't know when I'm going to go to office, but it expects me to go to office in the morning and to come back in the evening. So it runs more buses in the morning and more buses in the evening. That's an expectation. It's not a measured thing. It really doesn't know who is in the bus stop. But suppose, suppose there was a community where there were 400 people who worked in call centers and only left for office at three o'clock. Suppose. So at three o'clock or at 2.30, the city would decide that these guys have just finished coffee and gone for a bath. 15 minutes later, they are going to be ready and walking down the, taking the lift downstairs. In 25 minutes, I should have 40 buses ready for these guys to take, to go to office. So they need to actually provision 40 smart buses at 317 to take us to office. They don't need to run any number of buses before that, maybe one bus, two buses. So you see that the city becomes reactive to the need to go to office, right? And it could do that because of the connectedness of my apartment with the city transport service. Now, I'm sitting in the bus. The bus has arrived magically because when I arrived in the bus stop, the bus also arrived at the bus stop because it anticipated my appearing at the bus stop. Now I sit in the bus. I'm absolutely not conscious of how that bus got there. It seems to have appeared, but I'm happy because I need that bus. I get off the bus and as I get onto the bus, my device, let's say a wristband, let's say a ring, 
talks to the bar I hold to get into the bus and it deducts the ticket because I have already told it I will get off four stops later. It doesn't ask me any longer. Right? If I need any variation, I have to tell it. But normally it will learn. So there's a learning mechanism saying that, okay, this guy always goes to office at this time, probably is again going to office today. So that's, that's it. I get off at office. I'm absolutely not conscious that 40 buses were sent to my community just when I and my community mates stepped up. City. Now, instead of running 3000 buses and then adding 800 buses, then 1000 buses and running them all over the city, whether or not there are people, the city can buy only 1500 buses and commit those buses on an intelligent basis so that it services people when people need the bus service. It doesn't service be people before or after their need. Wonderful. That's, that's, that's a saving. <clears throat> 1500 buses instead of 3000 buses and adding buses, not 800 buses at a time, but maybe 60 buses at a time is a major saving, right? Major saving in pollution, major saving in, in um, time, major saving in cost, major saving in uh, inventory, in repair, in maintenance, right? because all buses will have to be scrapped after 10 years anyway. Right? But look at it from other points of view. Suppose there is another system, let's say a weather system, which is saying that this is March and flowers are blooming in Delhi. Now you are in Delhi, at the moment I am not, but flowers are blooming in Delhi and pollen is all over Delhi. Now that's a fact, that's, that's this, that's this, this thing, the data. Pollen is all over Delhi as a cloud. But the weather system, the weatherman is saying that today there's going to be a northeast wind at four kilometers. So it is, isn't it possible to look at the pollen, the particles of pollen over Delhi as a point cloud subject to a motive force wind, which is going to sweep the pollen first from Mughal Gardens down to, uh, let's say, Khan Market, from Khan Market to South Extension, from South Extension to Meroli, Meroli to Gurgaon, and, and so on down to Agra. So can I not predict that the pollen is going to move like this? And can I not then flash a message to known asthma people, asthma sufferers, that pollen is likely to be meeting you at 11.15 today, when you are in the bus. Please carry a nebulizer, please carry a mask, Right? Because you are going to be affected today. And if I put on the mask as a reactive measure, because the city told me to avoid the pollen cloud, it's people talking to data. Right? Now that, that is smart because it allows me to avoid a possible asthma attack or any complication which is respiration related. Now that is smart. Now you can see that you can always, always storyboard things like this. Now these things, to storyboard things like this, the first question which comes to our mind is, oh, he's just saying it because he's saying it in a lecture. These things are not possible. The question is if you have a framework like this, right? this becomes possible. If you have a structured formal way of writing programs for this, if these three things and the processes offer an API, then people can write using that API, the application programming interface, right? The API, you can write things which actually make things smarter. For instance, suppose the metro system, DMR, Delhi metro system, offers an API to the people which says, where is which metro at what time? It doesn't just publish a schedule. It says, which metro is where? Right? So it allows me to take a decision that should I take the pink line or should I take the yellow line because the yellow line metro seems to be one minute away whereas the pink line metro is only five minutes, is seven minutes away. So it allows me to make that decision and it can actually give me a route which uses the shorter metro line. That's reactive. It's reactive because a, process, a data from the metro system is submitted to the people, that's me, to my app 
allowing me to make a better decision, a smarter decision. <clears throat> I can storyboard indefinitely, but I think I have um, very few minutes left. So I will, I will move to one use case. Right? One use case which um, is a little close to my heart because, um, okay, I think, I think you, can, you can see this. You can't see this, this uh, Bible, the lines from the Bible. So all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. And this is my line which I've added to that. So let's look at one aspect, animals and agriculture. In every, every university I go to, I see a BTEC project or a MSc project on smart irrigation, smart farming, smart uh, whatever, smart uh, fertilizers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now, all of them somehow imply that the far farmer doesn't know how much water to give his plants. So I must put a sensor at the root of the plant and tell the farmer to put so many drops of water on the plant. Now look at that here for instance. If you, if you look at this portion of the slide, you see a plant, you see me watering it, but this water is not arbitrarily put on the plant. It is put on the plant by measuring the water level at the plant. Now, I'm sure you must have seen such projects. But then look at this project. Every plant, a sensor at the root, or one sensor for the entire field. Maybe putting a sensor at the root of every plant is only possible and feasible and justifiable if the plant itself is very expensive. Some rare orchid, for instance, or some very expensive plant, which justifies putting one sensor worth 500 rupees, 1000 rupees, 2000 rupees at its root. But what do farmers do? They take up a handful of soil, they crumble it, and they sense the moisture, and then they either irrigate the field or they don't irrigate the field. No farmer takes a dropper and puts 10 drops of water at the root of one plant and two drops of water at the root of another plant and 30 drops of water in another plant. But that's it. That's what our smart projects all imply that different plants will have different amounts of water, right? I, I'm sure there is a use case for that. For instance, if you are growing grapes, it doesn't make much sense. So smartness must be moderated. My point actually in this slide is that smartness must be moderated so that the amount of fertilizers, the amount of reuse of um, compost, the amount of interaction between rodents and plants and granaries, um, the interaction between what are called complete zone observatories, storage of these food items, all of this can be interneted, uh, if I may use the word, I mean, Maybe years from now, you can say that I heard him heard, use the word interneted. So internet connect these things so that we can smartly farm, smartly monitor, smartly apply VD side, smartly store the vegetables, check for spoilage, take them out before they are spoiled, reach markets which need those vegetables. So this is the internet of things in, in at work, right? You can do the same thing with animals, and I'm going to wind up in one minute. You can take systems of animals like this, for instance, a pigs, sheep, goats, uh, or a female male system of animals who are likely to give rise to a baby animal. Right? So you know that a cow and a bull periodically collaborate to produce a calf. And the calf is a great economic uh, milestone in a farmer's life 
because that's going to be the future cow or future bull. It leads to flesh, milk, other products. So putting the cow and the bull together at the right time is of great economic importance to the farmer. So checking this time at which you should put the bull and the cow together to get a calf can add orders of magnitude of profit to a farmer's economic lifetime. You can do the same thing in wildlife too. I'm going to stop because I'm running out of time, but you can do fisheries. For instance, you can check before you fish, where are the fish? So you can look at the oceans using a satellite. Then you can issue the advisory to the fisherman that there's no point going northwest today. There are no fish in that direction. Go southwest so that you catch the maximum amount of fish. So that's a fishing advisory you can issue. Where is the sensor? The satellite is the sensor. What is sensing? The camera in the satellite is sensing. Who made that sensor? We made the sensor. ISRO made the sensor. Who put it there? We put it there. Who gave the advisory? We gave the advisory to our fishermen through, through SMS, through mobile, through uh, web pages, etc., etc. But we basically maximize the economic yield of a fisherman's daily fishing life. You can do that to endangered species like turtles, like elephants, like vultures. Yes, vultures are also endangered species. Tigers, very well-known endangered species. Bats, very popular after COVID, right? After knowing that they cause these zoonotic progression of diseases, extremely popular creatures, bats. Sensing the presence of bats and where they are can tell you where the next Wuhan is coming from, right? Or koalas, cute, cute things which occur in Australia. But these cute things can cause havoc if they eat through trees, right? Beavers, which cause dams on rivers. So sense these things and our life becomes much more profitable because we depend on things like this for the food we eat, right? So I will stop here, right? I, I, in a longer, longer talk, maybe... I would have gone on to the to the things we do in IIT Delhi and uh, the tools and techniques we use and the stacks which we use. But today I will stop. And if there are any questions, my 30 minutes are up. I'll take those questions now. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Now the platform is open for questions and answer time. So on behalf of uh, another student, common questions I'd like to ask you. One of the challenges, challenges of IoT is concerned with data security. How can, you, can you type the question in the chat window? Because I'm I'm catching only some words of your microphone. Mm -hmm. I am watching the chat window, so you can just. Yes, yeah, uh, uh, in the chat box. Yeah. As a matter of fact, um, just as a suggestion, giving everybody the freedom to attend the seminar from home from their laptops through Zoom is a far, far easier and better and less polluting method of conducting seminars. So I, I would strongly advise that each, and, and, and this is something I'm advising because even in my classes, which are forced to be physical classes, I carry my laptop to the podium. I open MS Teams. My students open MS Teams. They're sitting in front of me, 300 of them with their laptops open and MS Teams on their laptops. And I'm talking into my laptop and they are looking into their laptops. The session is recorded. We are both in physical mode, but we are both using technology for teaching. So it is, it is very convenient. And if one student is ill or cannot attend, it makes no difference. My classroom extends much beyond the four walls of my classroom lecture. So just as a suggestion. Yeah, I see your question. The concern over data security and privacy, always a concern always a concern. As long as anybody else is interested in your data, this concern will remain. 
But what we do is we encrypt and we make our encryption system stronger and stronger. The only problem is IoT systems are necessarily very small systems. So they're constrained systems. They have small processors, very little memory in kilobytes and limited processing power. They are in effect sensing systems. So if you ask an IoT endpoint to do encryption, you're actually straining it. So the point is, one way of avoiding this is don't transmit all data. Not all data is actually important in an IoT. Uh, IoT system can sense many, many times in one second, but not all of that data is important at all. For instance, in, in, if you are sitting down on a chair, the second in which you sat down and the second in which you got up, these are the two important seconds in the one hour you sat on the chair. There is no point in transmitting, storing, archiving the data otherwise. So to, to aggregate the data, to select the data and contribute only relevant data is one aspect. After you do that, you can encrypt the data, right? And you can fuse it using your own fusion languages so that nobody else except you can understand what is being sent over the network. They can intercept, but they cannot understand. And very soon, the data which is going over the internet is going to lose its relevance. For instance, the chief guest is going to get up. So the fact that the chief guest got up in Delhi University is not going to be relevant to a person monitoring the chair in China, maybe six months after. So the relevance of the data becomes uh, questionable. So you can actually make data secure by making it irrelevant. That's another way of doing it. And standard encryption decryption always, of course, exists. So, second question from the I see the question. I <clears throat> advantage is I can I can get the question faster than you can read it. There is no real challenge as long as we want to make money. The challenge is that you don't make much money. So in the villages, you don't make money. So nobody goes to the village to install the internet or make it more robust or think about 6G and 7G in villages. They come last in the pecking order. We always can buy 5G phones in cities, but the villager has a limited, limited appeal to the uh, installers, which is why governments are mostly present in villages. I know for a long time, uh, BSNL was the only connectivity available in Indian villages. So real, there is no real thing. The, the, if I can sum it up in one word, the challenge is the money. The money you make. So because there is less money to be made, there is difficulty in committing capital expenditure to villages. That is the challenge. Otherwise, no. You know, you know that we have a fiber optic NOFN network, which is extending to 2.5 lakhs out of 3.6 lakh Indian villages. That is being done by BSNL, Railtel, and Power Grid. So if you have a fiber optic cable in the Sarpanch's house, you already have a 100 megabit uh, connection. Question is, how can you take it to one terabit? How can you take it to 400 terabit? That's a question of technology, but it's already an effort. And I might say this as a positive thing, that among countries around the world, the promise of India is huge. The way we are going, the what we are doing, our democracy, the way we are stepping up infrastructure investments, I think we are, we are in great shape at the moment. I mean, at, certainly we are very fertile ground for, a, for any 5G, 6G revolution which will come. And sooner or later, 5G is going to come to the villages very fast because it's going to be easy to roll out, easier than fiber optic cable. So that's, that's going to be how internet comes to the villages. Thank you, sir. The has been very enlightening for all of us. After listening to your lecture on Internet of Things, we all know how Apple Watch, Fitbit, automated screen lights, and our house security logs work. We can say now to start with only humans who are smart, but the gadgets which we talk to and sensitive are smart. Thank you.
Our next speaker in the technical section is Professor Baba Mitra from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Good afternoon, ma'am, and a very warm welcome to you, staff of the Orlando College. Professor Abha Mitra is a professor of instrumental instrumentation and applied physics at Indian Institute of Bangalore. Professor Mitra's area of research are nano and micro systems to study interfaces between different physical phenomena at nano scale. He obtained his PhD from IIT Bombay and further received Gordon Betty Moore Foundation postdoctoral. Fellowship from California Institute of Technology, USA. Currently, she has 12 CAG research scholars under her guidance, obtained four papers, ordered, authored three books, and was and has over 100 publications in national as well as in international journals. She has successfully completed nine projects funded by various national and international agencies. Professor Abu Mitra will give a talk on modeling design by graphene interface for molecular sensing and proteins. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, madam. Am I am I audible? Thank you, ma'am. Max, would you like to share these slides with us? Okay. Okay. So, uh, thank you so much for uh, thank you, madam, for for a nice introduction, and uh, thank you uh, to uh, to to the college for inviting me and. Uh, and really bringing me here in front of you to talk about some of the part which are relevant to to this symposium or seminar series what you are having right now so um as professor kar was talking about the mostly iot and and its relevance to the sensors and and you know the things are becoming more and more smarter with the bringing iot as as a, as a novel tool so um what I'm going to talk about is is uh, is very specific sensors on uh, what we develop in our lab is uh, for environmental monitoring is is a wide uh, uh, area which we look for is so we miss since we have very limited time here so I just picked up one topic which uh, which can show okay what are the different activities in this particular field we do is. So with the invent of this graphene and a lot of two dimensional materials, we we actually it gave, gave us the much more freedom to modify material properties for different applications. So we really don't count on some specific material, but here the we have the more freedom for the designing it and, and make the make the devices or sensors smart. So we so in this talk, I'm going to talk about the, what the, the brief introduction about the chemical sensors. So because we use a lot of gases and chemicals and how we modify graphene in this particular talk is the nitrogen dioxide. How do we sense as, as an example and uh, how we make molecular sensing to have the molecule controlling the sensor. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a both the ways. So molecular and it can also be used as a molecular memory devices. So uh, in IUPAC, the sensor is defined as the as a device that transforms chemical information. And chemical information can come in different forms, like concentration. What is the uh, what is the the amount what we, we are detecting, and and what is the composition and analysis, and a lot of forms of the output which we can detect here. And uh, so, what you see in this first schematic is the 
you have a black box which actually converts any kind of chemical interaction and gives you the output in various forms which can be electrical optical or even it can be mass detection or temperature changes so depending on the environment where you want to put these sensors your output can change and also depending on the what kind of sensor you 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 are using it so there's no need to tell that why we really require chemical sensors because the application is really very wide starting from industries to the labs to the healthcare and also for the security so there are a lot of sectors where these sensors can be used and uh, uh so okay so chemical as i said that there is lot of variety of sensors which can be made and uh, it depends on the the mechanism and it depends on the material what you are using and based on that you you can have a number of uh, sensors uh, for your application so what basically what output i'm going to talk in this talk is mostly electrical output and uh, and uh, the material what you see is the so metal oxide semiconductors are are really very conventional uh, material pretty successful because the response is very robust while on the other hand new materials have come and and the responses of course they every everything has has its pro, pros and pros and cons so so not really talking about it so carbon is is the is the highlight of this this talk here and uh, so i'll just skip that what are the advantage this advantage but yes something to think about that why really we we want to move on to having something smarter and which which we want to really go away from the what exists already conventionally so we depend on the materials using the new materials using the new mechanism new using the new physics new chemistry and and everything so that can give you the smartness of the sensors so graphene is uh, those who don't know so the, it's it's a carbon so it's a carbon it's a black carbon and the only uh, thing is what we see in a normal form of carbon is, is a graphite it's called graphite and graphite what you see is the extreme left schematic is is a layered structure so it's all the layers are just weakly bonded to each other and that's how we get this coal and other forms of carbon in our daily life um uh, so what we do what novelty graphene got is that when you peel out one layer that's graphene and and what was discovered is the graphene has very different properties than the graphite so electrical point of view or its electronic properties are are, are really uh, excellent and novel means of course experimentally people have, have hadn't seen this before so that's how people got very excited about that okay yes this is something new uh and and after we discovered this carbon nanotube this was like after many many decades when we are seeing something new has come up so we have seen diamond we have seen graphite and we have seen in a form of any kind of nano materials carbon nanotube and then now we have a planar structure so excitement comes also not because of this is a new material but also we really want to have something beyond silicon do we have any any semiconductor which can replace silicon technology so uh, of course this is a, meta, a semi metallic form of uh, form of semiconductor which 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 means properties can be tuned so it can be semiconducting can be metallic and and depending on on the way you use it so this is about the graphene and pretty thin and uh, important thing is if we see the chemical point of view we can modify because it has a lot of free electrons on its surface so we can modify it with anything so for, especially especially for the sensors you want to have the selectivity and when you want to have the selectivity it means that you want to have a different different atoms attached to its surface so that your specific molecules can interact very closely or 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 can give the sensor very uh, good specificity so talking about graphene here and why we want to talk about no2 nitrogen dioxide among lot of gases so this as, as i mentioned as is one of one example which we we use it but there are a lot of gases and especially when we are talk about the uh, these gases because of the emissions so nitrogen dioxide sulfur dioxide carbon dioxide carbon monoxide hydrogen sulfide there are a lot of gases which are not only toxic in nature but they have the very long term effect on the on health so there are alarming 
numbers when we inhale these these gases in when these are present in in our surroundings so seems like one ppm parts per million of only one number in parts per million is really really dangerous to inhale so it's important to have the detection and detection is important because then only we can actually do the take the measures how to how to how not to stop the em emission but the how to reduce the emission or or what other measures we can take to to have the uh, health secured so as i mentioned that there are a lot of mechanisms first one is the adsorption energy of the gas molecule which is like surface dependent process interface dependent process and structure dependent process so one does the changes the adsorption energy of gas which which actually gets adsorbed another is resistance change and third is the gas accessibility if you change the surface then you you can have the more gases to be adsorbed on the surface so the, so there's a reason we want to really modify this structure. So we take graphene, we make graphene from graphite. So we peel out all the layers. And then what we do is to get the uh, selectivity for specifically for nitrogen dioxide, what we do is we use actually metal. It's, it's, a no, it's a noble metal. So it's not oxide. So I'll tell you the what, what is why we, we actually selected it. So as an example sensor, so then we 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 are interested in 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 actually uh, evaluating the electrical properties from this. So we make electrodes, and then what we do is we make a very thin film of uh, the the material on top of these electrodes, and then we go from there to measure the electrical response when we expose it to the uh, to the gas. So these are the you can see these are the SEM images where uh, you see graphene. Uh, very thin layer, and then these tiny round circles, which are the metals, which are the metal, actually, the, in this case, this is just a strontium. So, of course, there are a lot of material characterization which can be done to, to confirm that, okay, what you're doing is is either it's chemically bonded or it's it's a, what kind of bonding is there. So, we did a we did lot of measurements there. So, XPS, Raman, and and so most importantly here, this is the sensing response. So what do you see on the left uh, uh, graph is it's an IV graph, which is linear. So what it tells you that, uh, so when you are sensing, you are making a sensor, the contact should be resistive. There should not be any kind of non-linearity because that can interfere your, your, your response here. So, and then what the second graph, what you see is the uh, sensor response. So what you see in this graph is the sensor response comes as an electrical change of the or electrical output, which comes as a change in the electrical resistance. And then this is the time. So over the time, what you do is so concentration is in one parts per million to 80 to 100 parts per million. And what you see is response actually keeps changing. So pretty much responsive to the change in concentration. And what, why you don't see recovery is because this is a dynamic process. So you're not really giving time for the desorption, but there is a minute desorption in each cycle you can observe. So this is what we mean. And then for the analysis to uh, why, I mean, what makes a metal is attached to it, how it makes any difference. So what do you see in this table first that the, RGO alone gives, as a graphene, gives RGO, RGO is reduced graphene oxide because you are reducing oxygen from the graphene oxide and making G only. So that's how it is RGO. So for one ppm, the, cons, the, the sensitivity is 0 0.51, while on the adding this just metal particle, it becomes more than double of it. At all concentration, the result is almost same. So percentage enhancement is much more in compared to the uh, only graphene. So graphene basically what it gives you the a path to the con con a conducting path because these are the tiny particles. They don't have actually continuous surface for electron to 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 transport from one electrode to another electrode. So so adding this 
metal particle to graphene actually it enhances its its characteristics graphene's characteristics to make it a specific so what do you see in this equation is s is equal to k multiplied by c to the power one by n it's called the Fordlick equation it's a uh, um so how, how so okay so this is a, on the left side what you graph what you see the graph is sensor response with the concentration and you can see the comparative responses here. This is bottom is the R0 and the upper, upper one is the R0 strontium. So what you do is you do the fitting for this equation, you get some parameters. So what K means is the, it's indi uh, what it indicates is the adsorption capacity. So which has the more adsorption capacity before adding a strontium or after adding a strontium and this factor actually tells you the, the heterogeneity of the material, which should increase with the add or with the addition of the uh, strontium and C is a concentration in PPM. So what you see is the K has a dominant uh, role here, or K has got change. It's, it's almost double. So what K is, it, it's K means the adsorption capacity. So basically by adding a strontium, what you are doing is the, you are increasing the adsorption capacity of the gas and there is no effect or kind of very, very minimum effect here on the this power factor. So now we know that what we are doing and uh, how to do it. So then we went on to, okay, we can we go below one PPM and, and can we, what is the detection limit? So we measured the detection limit to the parts per billion. So what we could measure in this case is the, it's a 478 is the number which came out from the first graph, what you see, and uh, experimentally also we were able to. So what you have seen in the previous graph was the, the cycles were not coming back. Cycles were just going up, little bit down, a small desorption. Then again, you change concentration and this is how it was going up. What you see in this right-hand side graph is the, you can see that desorption is coming down. So what we did is, uh, if you want to have the complete desorption of the molecules, we use the ultraviolet light. So somehow this, this helped uh, desorption of these molecules mm -hmm. and we could get perfect sensor, which where the desorption at any concentration, even though this is a dynamic response, we were able to get it. So this, is, this came out to be very perfectly perfect sensor to detect NO2, NO2, which seems to be really contagious for, for many reasons. And then experimentally, we also tested that if theoretically the limit of detection for uh, this gas is 478 ppb, when, then we exposed to 500 ppb and we were able to see this detection very well. So pretty low concentration of the gas, higher concentration certainly is not the problem and uh, we were able to detect. Then second thing is the selectivity. So if you have a diff, it, in atmosphere, you have different gases. So, so specificity or, or the selectivity of the sensor response is shown in this right-hand side graph, where you can see that the response towards the NO2 gas is, is much higher than the other gases when these are exposed to nearly same concentration or, or, or whatever is the available concentration. So third thing is very important, the humidity because of the uh, the condition, environmental conditions change over the year. So centrally, humidity plays a great role uh, until unless you, uh, so it, important thing is these are the room temperatures and we are not using any heater. So conventionally metal oxide sensors, they use heater for the desorption or any, any kind of working. So um, then what we figured out that there is a role, certainly good to know, then you can actually take any measure to stop it and how to how to have the constant responses. So when we to 90%, we saw that the sensor response also increases. The reason is the NO2 actually miss, I, I would say that it dissolves in water and then what it makes is the NO3. So it means that basically you are dealing with the two gases altogether. So this is how this electron exchange changes and then you have the, more responses uh, in the uh, so uh, how much time do do I have? Is it uh, when I started? I forgot. Please let me know when uh, thirty minutes are over. 
there is another uh, question that a uh, human would like to ask you. Maybe you can ask us uh, three to four minutes. So what I heard is nearly five minutes, is it? Yeah, yeah. That's fine. You can take five minutes and after that it will be followed by a question and answer time. Sure. So, uh, okay. Sure, I'll take five, another five minutes to to, uh, to wind up. So uh, to look at the carefully what what really happened with the, these strontium particles are added to graphene. So what do you see is A. It's, it's a schematic of A. This is how graphene looks. It's a band structure. So we don't call it semiconductor. But we call it semiconductor when these cones actually have some space in between. So and these can be modified. So electrically, these can be modified. So uh, right now, considering it, it to be in a metallic state, what we have is uh, um, when we expose it to... So, so in air, what happens is there are a lot of ambient uh, oxygen which attaches. And what happens is it, it actually modifies its Fermi level. So if it modifies the Fermi level and we further uh, expose it so, so then you expose to NO2 gas, then what happens is the NO2 is electron accepting gas. So it needs electrons and graphene is, it has a lot of electrons on, on its surface. So, and especially when in, in, in room temperature conditions, it's a, it's a, you can, so it, it is more susceptible to, to attract these gases and these gases take the electron and get, this is how it gets associated with the, uh, this is how you get the electrical changes here because of the Fermi level further deepens into the valence band. Then when you have attached this strontium, what you see in the bottom is the strontium. Uh, so what you see is, is metal, it's a metal. So there's no uh, dearth of uh, electrons. Its surface has electrons. Basically what you are doing is by adding strontium, you're adding more electrons to it. So what is happening is now Fermi level further goes up. So further it goes up, so it becomes more of the, uh, so NO2 sees a lot of electrons in it and the, the response further enhances here. So, so this is the mechanism we, we, uh, we thought that this is how it is working and this is what it is giving you, the, uh, the changes in the electrical response. So uh, Maybe I have a few more minutes, so I, I can just go on to discuss more on the device side of it. So I'll just skip a few slides and directly go to the device. So I mentioned that there is a molecular sensing. So molecular sensing or, or if this NO2 can be used as a molecular memory device, what does it mean? Memory means we are saving something. This is how the memory works. So what we do is we microfabricate devices. So in this case, we are not really making graphene from the RGO. We are making graphene from the graphite crystal. It's a single crystal. What we do is you just peel it, peel one layer by hand. You can do it. And then what you do is you microfabricate these electrodes, transfer on it to is the, with the MOS2. So these are two few layers of the uh, materials, graphene and MOS2. So in this case, what we did is uh, we actually made some defect. So we removed some carbon from the, from the, uh, from the graphene. And uh, so we'll see the, why we did it. We wanted to have some defects induced to it. We do, did it in between those, the, that gap, we transferred MOS2. So now we have this device of few micron scale level. So this is, this acts as a field, uh, field defect transistor. So field defect, so this is a transistor made up of graphene and MOS2, and it shows very well. It's a turning on and off characteristics. And uh, so we just uh, skip to here. Then what happens is that when we, we expose it to MOS2, oh, sorry, NO2, I'm sorry. So NO2 is electron accepting gas, just to remind you. And what is happening is on the right-hand side, what you see is that with gas, what we see is something very weird. Weird in the sense when, until you un don't understand something, it looks weird that, okay, so it was coming so cleaner, but suddenly you expose something. And then what you see is that there is a step on this IV response. So, and then we try to play more with it. 
and we tried to change the concentration and then we wanted to see what is what is happening to this step actually this step was moving up and down when you increase the concentration so suddenly this effect was coming from the number of molecules first of all there is something happening with the electrons which are present in, in at the interface of mos2 and graphene and which is making this the whole interface as a gas sensitive or, or, or a gas sensitive. So we did uh, work on it and uh, what we, so this is what the response you can see here. This is, these are the, some cycles we measured here. And uh, what here, so those steps which you were seeing earlier, we actually, we, we, what we did is we applied a gate pulse. So from the back field, which graphene and both MOs2 are sensitive to. And what we found is that these molecules actually, it goes away. It's like just kicking the molecule out of the surface. And what you see in this graph is that you expose it and suddenly what happens is that the response comes down. It goes up, it just comes down when you apply the field. So, it's, so <laughs> this is what we call as a, as a memory device because you have a one and zero you have the Boolean response coming from this FET device. And this is purely because of the gas interaction. So yeah, so this is what we, so one thing is we, we make the material to sense it. Another is if we can use the molecule to make a device. So both the ways we, we do this engineering of the material and make, we make devices and we make sensors this is, uh, by using different methods chemical methods, physical methods, and a lot of other methods. So this is this, yeah. So with this, I would like to end the talk here. And uh, thank you so much for listening to me. So I'll take any questions if you have. Thank you, madam. So I see one question is, are MOS2 device based devices be used as biosensors? Yes. So biosensors means you can always modify the surfaces according to, so I just gave you one example of how any kind of molecule really interacts with one surface by modifying it. And it's all about the, so biosensors are also based on the, the kind of interaction you they have on the surfaces. And and certainly yes, there are actually devices yes. So what is the gas in the If you want, I can do it. There's another button. So we did everything uh, on uh, in air. So we have not tested anything under vacuum or any kind of inert atmosphere. Yes. So, and the, these work very well. Yes. These are environment friendly. Yes. These are not toxic materials. These are, these are semiconductor as the, as the, what we have like silicon. So, so material itself is not really a toxic material. And, uh, and, and so just like, I, I think, yeah, it can be seen as a, as a, another silicon. For the devices, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank <laughs> you.
Hello, sir. Am I audible? Hello, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, I can hear you. for inviting me for this particular symposium and this is really a great pleasure for me to interact with all of you so what i feel that you know the the, uh, the most of the uh, you know the audience is uh, quite diverse so i would like to you know uh, concentrate myself into uh, uh, mainly to the basic part of this so can uh, this this uh, my slides are visible Yeah. Yes, sir. You are visible. Are my slides are visible? Yes, sir. Yeah, this is good. Sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, I would, you know, like to present before all of you the the basics of uh, these plant biotechnology and what are the different, you know, the uh, the way forward for the uh, uh, the food security that we know that the food security is a very important. point right now that you all remember that you know once upon a time uh, in in if you ask your you know the grandparents uh, probably they will know that when uh, uh, our uh, prime minister that time prime minister uh, uh, lal bahadur shastri he has asked the, the the country to do at least one day fasting you know so just for the there was no uh, food uh, uh, available in our, our country but now we are you know uh, two three years ahead of the the uh, the food is are you know uh, already filled in the our uh, the stores and the, the the storage areas so we don't have that particular problem but we have to think ahead of time so what is going to be in future is that we are going to increase our population so whether we are ready to feed our population because of uh, the 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 recent advancement in the uh, uh, plant biotechnology or not so that i will you know carry forward uh, the entire things in in a subsequent manner manner first i will discuss about uh, the the uh, basics of you know the green revolution and then we will uh, talk about some environmental impact on the green revolution and uh, then we will uh, shift to the new uh, paradigm which is uh, coming uh, forward to uh, uh, maybe it is going to be important for our food security by 2050 so the i, will, I have discussed uh, uh, in my, i am going to discuss in my lecture about uh, the introduction food security how climate change has affected the food security plant biotechnology and food security and new technology and uh, way forward so basically the, when we talk about uh, food security is uh, all about the food availability 
food accessibility, utilization, and stability. So that's why you know that it's very important. This is a recent data uh, from uh, the FAO stat uh, 2023, where uh, you can just see that uh, you know the percentage employment in agriculture is estimated to be 44 percent. 44 percent in in our going to be in our country and uh, the the total percentage of agricultural gdp is near about 16.77 so this is going to be very very important uh, for our uh, country although you know the the less number of uh, uh, people are now coming for the farming uh, community but uh, definitely we are, we need to you know the the because of urbanization our you know the field uh, are shrinking so the uh, the uh, we have to you know grow the plants as well as we have to see the challenges of the climate change in the future so if you see this particular slide this is a you know the the availability of the groundwater level in india so you can just see that the, the area which was very very important for the punjab haryana and western uttar pradesh was very important for our green revolution is now having uh, going to be is really alarming is going to be low uh, as uh, if you compare to the groundwater level so th this we have to you know that means we need to have certain plants which are drought uh, or you know the less water they can grow in less water all those things are uh, going to be uh, very important even in the southern india which is also you know uh, having uh, going to have low or medium uh, uh, ground water level and this uh, we all have to talk about in this uh, the changing scenario with the climate change so the yield of uh, rice is going to be decreased uh, by 2050 is near about 14 to 26 percent this is a global uh, no data that is going to have wheat is near about 32 to 44 percent and maize is uh, near about two to five percent soybean is nine to eighteen percent and the price is going to increase you must have seen that, that the price has gone uh, very high in in case of the, uh, the our neighboring country like pakistan so the wheat is going to be 81 to 102 percent maize 58 uh, percent to 97 percent and uh, soybean 14 to 49 percent so that means we need to you know address these questions in uh, before uh, uh, the, the the 2050 so that we can you know control all these prices as well as availability to the our community so first of all i would uh, like to discuss about the green revolution in india which has happened you know long back in 70s and 80s and uh, the, the most important thing is that uh, the, it uh, uh, in the norman borlaug you probably you all know that about him uh, the, he is the known as the father of green revolution, and he has got a Nobel Prize not in the case of you know the science or scientific things, but he has got a Nobel Prize in peace. That means you know if you're uh, if you are empty stomach, probably you are having more chance to fight among each other for the greens and other things. This you, this is going to be uh, you know you can see in our neighboring country in the near future. So this uh, we don't want and we want to you know uh, things about uh, think about many things uh, in uh, ahead of time so if you see that you know the, the india and pakistan both were having the the varieties where uh, in the during the green revolution were low yielding but they were resistant to the the various diseases but some of the varieties which came from the mexico which was having the very high yielding but they were susceptible so what they have done is that they have made a cross uh, where you all know that uh, uh, Professor M. S. Swaminathan was also involved and many place, uh, people in our countries, uh, they have contributed in this particular green revolution. And uh, they have you know, uh, used this high yielding variety, the use of chemical fertilizer and new projects were, were built where uh, irrigation has potentially generated and by this time you know the, the there was a um, you know the uh, uh, nationalization of banks 
and this has given also the opportunity to the farmers to take loans for their farming and uh, the use of tractors motor pumps and farming many things uh, they have started uh, working on this and the, the most important impact is that the, in the green revolution which has increased the yield of the food crop like rice and wheat very high the nation has attained the self sufficiency in the food production and government of india has started maintaining the buffer stocks what i mean you know the initially i have told about that that two to three years you know the food is uh, there in our you know stocks so that is because of the fci godowns and uh, the the storage houses where you know the, the our buffer stocks of food fertilizers and fertilizers and seeds are there so the the most important uh, point is that government is able to curb uh, the uh, curb the inf uh, in, uh, inflationary the trends of the food products so the most uh, you know when we talk about this uh, uh, the green revolution there was you know a very important uh, factor that we all uh, have forgotten that is the environmental impact on the green revolution and this environmental impact of green revolution is mostly the pesticides and fungicides used and then you can just see that uh, i have already mentioned that 70s and 80s the the actually green revolution has started and you can just see that per you know the capita the consumption of the pesticides was very very less in 50s and but it has started very you know uh, jumping in 70s and 80s it was maximum and 90s also it was there so this, this how this is going to affect in our you know day to day life that you will come to know in the next few slides and here you can just see that you know the although the the consumption has now gone down little bit again increased but it is you know almost remaining uh, same but it has never reached to the the the, the time when we were having you know almost no pesticide or uh, fungicides so this has you know that if you see that in the india the uh, the per hectare fertilizer used in india is in a maximum in punjab which was the most prominent stage of the the green revolution and this uh, you must have realized in the recent times that if you visit you any you know village nearby you'll find that the, the ponds of the the villages are now turning green this is because of the indiscriminate use of fertilizers which is getting leached out from the field and going to the the near about uh, nearby ponds and uh, th this is actually increasing the fungal uh, increasing the algal growth so th these are some of the important thing which has started because of this green revolution the one most important thing that uh, this is so shocking uh, you know tale of the india's which is called as a cancer train and if you just google in the in the uh, you'll find a, a, you know the cancer train train if you google you'll find that there was a, you know the train which was running earlier from you know the batinda to bikaner because bikaner was you know the having a cancer hospital where the uh, detection facility was there so if you see that in this particular slide the the line which is coming here is mostly you know the cancer patients or their you know attendants uh, were have uh, traveled uh, you know every night you know the it's overnight train it was overnight train and uh, this that's why they called as a cancer train because most of the you know the people who have started in this particular uh, um, uh, train um, has you know either they are attendants or they were having the disease so they you know the many uh, this type of things has happened because of uh, this green revolution and uh, another point uh, that we have started uh, is uh, you all know that uh, you know i am working in one of the the uh, disease of uh, uh, tea and uh, this is the uh, picture uh, we have taken from the uh, the when i visited the darjeeling and assam uh, fields where i found that you know the, the the it is the liquid copper fungicides are being you know uh, used in in uh, the field uh, and it is very important uh, to uh, pluck those new leaves after the seven days of the spray but because of the commercial pressure people are you know plucking the the seeds uh, you know the 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 
leaves just two three, two three days after the spraying so this you know that still i feel that you know no tea what we are drinking is organic ground so the, the, this is another uh, the, these are the some of the challenges which has started um, in the green revolution in 21st century that the saturation of the crop improvement opportunities the sustainable agriculture and environmental perspective so whatever you know the the problem that we have faced during our first green revolution that we should not get repeated in the in the next uh, generation of the the crop improvement and the speed of the improving crop uh, for better yield and value addition so that you know uh, people have started uh, you know many of uh, this type of uh, things because of the green revolution you can just see that uh, you know in 50s the per capita availability of the food grains was 124 but in 2014 you just see that it's near about 324 it is not, it has now increased to the 362 yesterday i, I could find out from the FAO uh, data so this is you know that uh, although the increase in uh, the productivity food productivity is there but at least you know we should have for you know the population is also increasing so we should have you know a second green revolution and uh, uh, this is uh, how we uh, do we feed more people without further damaging our planet that should be our primary goal so the pm recently uh, he has called the the second uh, for the second green revolution so the scientist has already you know started uh, thinking about uh, this uh, second green revolution to feed our uh, you know many things the people have started the government has started soil health card and many other opportunities like uh, credit policies and other things that that has been changed in uh, recent times and uh, the, this uh, the most of the uh, uh, this soil health card is going to be answer to those those you know the areas where uh, the people are indiscriminately using the pesticides fungicides as well as fertilizers so these uh, are some of the things that we need to uh, consider in for the future the second green revolution how we can achieve have we learned from our mistakes from the first gm plants for the genome edited plants uh, which are helpful the myths and apprehensions about the gmos public perceptions and acceptance of the new technology and the way forward so that i am going to discuss about uh, the many apprehensions of the gm crops that they are different from the naturally occurring plants they are going to change the uh, the entire gene pool and they are bad for the human uh, and animal health so uh, and they are bad for the environment so that this you know that we have to think about in in a global manner as well so there are some myths that uh, you know that we don't uh, uh, whatever the, the the food that we eat is basically is a naturally occurring uh, plants but actually this is a myth you know food we actually eat and consume consume it has been you know extensively modified from their original form since you know the uh, the the agriculture settlement uh, settlement for the, uh, the human being in uh, for the agriculture near about 10000 years ago so how i will just give you a glimpse of the few examples uh, that uh, you all know that you know many of the plants have, has been or the crop plants has been developed in uh, the river basins where you know the domestication of these uh, some of the crop uh, has happened and we, the, because of the, these river basins they have started this is just an example that i am going to give that we call it a selection breeding which had started near about 10,000 years ago and by our forefathers. So what they used to do that they like in the natural variation within the population, they used to take the, the, the better yield or better things for, you know, the, the, suppose this is a maize crop. So where, you know, the, this particular out of these, uh, this one is the looks very, you know, healthy and better. So they have taken these uh, seeds and subsequent generation, they used to, you know, uh, select for the better crops. So you can just see that some of the, the crops, which has been you know, isolated from the archaeological sites of the Mexico, where you can just, just see that uh, the 7,000 years ago, the, this crop was very small, even the, just like uh, one rupees coin. So now at the 500 years ago, that, that uh, we do have a bigger crop, 
and after that also we have we do have a new one is even in a double than this uh, this particular cop so these are some of the things which has already modified and uh, during the breeding the, the most important variety of the rice which has been you know the started that the original if you see that in the blue is the original rice you know and uh, uh, the we have started with the mutation and the recombination and the inversion and translocation events by the breeding uh, lines during the uh, first breeding revolution and when we developed this ir64 you can just see that the entire genome of the rice has already modified so there is nothing called you know the natural uh, things but uh, the, we have to think about the some of the advances of the genetic technology which can contribute to the improve the, the planets and uh, the, there are many things which you now we we consider is the marker assisted selection genome wide association studies recombinant DNA technology and uh, raising of transgenic plants cisgenics and transgenic i will just give a glimpse of the for the students i will just give a, the glimpse of all these things and then transgrafting and precision genome editing which is very very recent so the usually you know the the integration earlier it was you know the suppose there is a elite variety of tomato and there is a poor tomato variety which is resistant so they used to cross uh, these uh, two varieties and develop a plant but what about you know the if uh, the some of the things which is available in some other genus and species then you have, we have to come to a different uh, strategy that uh, uh, this is also i'm just skipping these slides but uh, this is one of the example where you know the submergence rice uh, variety has been developed in india where you know the swarna variety was you know the growing very good in the southern india and the uh, sub uh, that is the uh, the submergence submergence tolerance is basically you usually we grow uh, plants uh, the rice plants into in a you know the during the rainy season but if the rain, um, the water logging persists for more than 15 or 16 days then uh, it is harmful for the 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 crop so what happens like uh, this particular submergence tolerance was very important because even though it is more than 15 days of the water logging we could, uh, they got you know the good uh, you know the, the, it is not dying you know because of the water logging so they have crossed these things and ultimately they have got swarna sub one which you can just see that these are swarna sub one you can just see that this was swarna variety and this is swarna sub one the swarna variety is now after the water logging it has gone bad but uh, the swarna sub one is better so this this type of things uh, is uh, people are talking about now the genetic modification uh, with is another breeding method where you know the suppose earlier i have talked about the elite tomato is being you know crossed with the the, the some of the tomato which is cultivated but here you can you know the with the gm crops you can you know take a crop like this is aerodopsis plant or any other plant like chili if you can take a gene and you can transform to the elite uh, tomato variety and you can get a disease resistance in this regard so there are a few uh, you know the genetic uh, methods are there which is available by which you can generate the, the transgenic plants the cisgenics are basically the, uh, the sometimes you know whenever you have in your mind uh, about the gm crops people talk about bt uh, crops or bt plants but bt is not everything now you know that we, what we call a cisgenics like, like suppose one gene from the apple which is a red apple is is going to transform to the green apple then it is you know going to have the same uh, same genus which is uh, offering the, the the gene to the 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 apple plant so the, this is called cisgenics the um, the this type of things is uh, still happening the gm example you all know about this uh, bt cotton and many of the plants uh, nowadays uh, you will see in the, the in the field uh, of uh, karnataka and uh, andhra and maharashtra gujarat they are bt cottons cotton is still growing uh, there uh, government has you know started uh, working on this particular things 
long back and uh, the the crop plant is still having the some problem although some of the the good cheese that people have started you know uh, uh, taking for, uh, forward for the second green revolution and uh, they started you know for the breeding now uh, usually you know for the breeding they used to uh, cover for near about 10 uh, generation to sometimes 15 generation for introduction of certain characters but now because of the speed breeding you can uh, you can you know do uh, very fast all these things you can uh, go for 8 to 10 uh, you know generation of the plants in uh, this is a new technology which has uh, come up uh, in just one year of time so some of the plant people have shown that they're like eight generation in one year of time this is called speed breeding and then marker assisted selection which has given you know the opportunity for uh, the use of molecular biology for the selection of the recombinant lines and the background by which you know you can get very you know fast uh, uh, the integration of the, the genes which uh, earlier it was you know eight to ten generation now it has reduced to uh, four generation or three generation sometimes four generation or three generation so what is happening here is that you know the new technology which has come up which is known as you know the genome engineering technology which you all know that uh, by the gene finger nucleases and very popularly known as our genome editing by CRISPR-Cas method, which has started, uh, uh, I think, uh, in uh, la last 10 years of time. Now, government, uh, the good thing is that government of India has recognized these th things as uh, you know, non-GM crops, and now they have allowed to uh, do all these things. So. So genome ed editing is the new technology by which we can, you know, definitely go for the the cr crop improvement or, and getting the new crop uh, plants. So the the first uh, gene uh, genetic modified crop is still waiting, and that uh, is by uh, the, your. Uh, yeah, I am just ending. So is uh, by your vice chancellor. And uh, the, I'm, I would like to end with a positive note that if you think, link the public policy, science and public understanding for bright future of India. Thank you very much. Uh, you can write to me uh, for any other query. Uh, yeah, I, I can't hear you uh, properly. Can, can, can you write in the, yeah. Can plant biotechnology improve with the nutritional value? Yes, yes, definitely. You know, there, there are so many, you know, there now the, the people talk about biofortification of uh, the, the plants. You know, even uh, the, the golden rice is one of the examples which has come up uh, for, uh, for uh, the anthocyanin pigmentation and also the iron uh, you know enrichment many people have started you know working on the protein rich crops so that uh, that we can you know definitely we can uh, work on uh, in the future so many things are not only the, the for the uh, the nutrition but anti nutrition things also people are talking about now it is uh, which we, we can reduce from many uh, in India, many uh, people are working in this particular field. Thank you, sir, for speaking. Uh, sir, uh, such an interesting topic. I'm sure everyone here, especially also in front of being beneficial by ability, we can understand now that how biotech and technology can manipulate the genetic makeup of organism for the production of agricultural products with high nutritional value. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, sir. Our next speaker in this session is Professor Praveen Kumar, 
from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. So it's an honor to have you with us today. I have sent a very warm welcome to you on behalf of three of the group company. Dr. Pradeep Kumar is a professor in the Department of Material Engineering in the Institute of Science, Bangalore. He has many feathers to his cap. He has served as a visiting scientist in the University of Arlington, Europe, Germany. He was a chairperson of International Relations at IISC Bangalore and member of the Department of Home Surveillance Committee, Department of Material Science at IISC Bangalore. He has pursued BTEC in Mechanical Engineering from IIT Kanpur. MS and PLT, Mechanical Engineering from University of Southern California. He is a member of multiple professional societies like Indian Institute of Medicine and Indian Science Congress Association, to name a few. Apart from having over 126 publications in national and international journals, he has obtained three patents, authored four books and deliver multiple talks. He has been presented with several accolades like Upper Kalam Technology Innovation National Fellowship and Young Engineer Award by Indian National Academy of Engineering, to name a few. And the list goes on. Professor Praveen Kumar will give a talk on carbon nanoscope from fundamental mechanical response to potential applications. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, madam, for such a nice <clears throat> introduction. You can hear me, am I right? All of you? Okay. So it's my pleasure to uh, you know, share some of the works that we have been doing in this area of carbon nanotube foams. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I will uh, try to uh, demonstrate that uh, you know, uh, at least towards that direction where we can take it uh, where we can have some interesting applications. Uh, so before I do that, I must uh, acknowledge a few people, uh, like various PhD students and, and interns, because all the work that I'm going to show you uh, was done essentially by uh, these students. Uh, on this work, uh, I have collaborated with Professor Abha Mishra. She, is, uh, she has been uh, kind enough to give us all the samples that we have tested. And the funding for these projects uh, came initially from CSIR, and then it was also supported by uh, DST. So uh, let's uh, see what is this CNT foam, or or sometimes we call them as CNT porous. Sometimes we also call them a vertically aligned, uh, you know, carbon nanotube. So there are various names of this same thing. Uh, but what it looks like. So, so first of all, this looks like something like this box that you see here, right? So this is about a millimeter thick and several millimeters wide and you know several millimeters long. So this is actually something, unlike the when we think of carbon nanotubes, we start to think of something which is very small in size, something that we have to see only in the microscopes. Unlike that, this is something that is composed of carbon nanotubes, but this is actually an engineering material because I can hold it in my hand. I can actually manipulate it in the way I want. So that is really a nice thing about this, this structure that what we are looking at. But of course, as we start to look at any of the cross sections uh, in microscopes, uh, for example, then we'll start to see how it is composed of. So at higher magnification, we will see that these are various strands of carbon in tubes, which are uh, curved and they are kind of uh, you know joined together as you can clearly see at this magnification using some sort of a van der Waal interactions. And at a very high magnification, if we go in TEM, then we will start to look at individual carbon nanotubes. And then we can see there that this is actually one carbon nanotube. And we can see a lot of these lines. Essentially, what it means is that it is actually a multi-walled carbon nanotube, uh, which is actually a, all, all these carbon nanotubes are actually concentric in that sense. And this is important to note uh, that is, we are talking about multi-walled carbon nanotubes. And this has an important implication in whatever we are looking at. So, so basically, uh, this structure that we can hold it in hand, we can test it in, uh, you know, by applying some uh, mechanical load. We can see the response. This is something that we can put it in our, uh, you know, anywhere that we want to put. It, we can stick it, 
is actually composed of something which looks like this at the end. And this one has some very interesting uh, functional properties. And, and so, so the, the idea that what we are going to discuss today is, is kind of correlating this, whatever the multifunctional properties that this shows and how it kind of like reveals itself when we are looking at an ensemble, uh, you know, which at, at the end, which looks like this. So, so that's the basic idea. And if you look at this uh, carbon nanotubes, then uh, as you can see from this picture, this uh, ACM pictures, a lot of open space is there. And that means essentially this is foam, this is porous, and it has only density of about, you know, a very small density of 0.28 gram per centimeter cube. Uh, that is, sorry, that is a theoretical density, but it is actually 20% of that. So one fifth of that is the density of this thing. So 80% of whatever we are seeing here, it's just open air and hence that's why we call it as foams and 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 that's that's the that's that's you know we are going to look at how uh, the properties here affects the property here in terms of the mechanical response so now we were we got excited uh, in this area by you know from this simple picture that we have here so there was a theoretical study done by Gu and Guo that was published in long ago almost 20 years ago and what they did was uh, they did some DFT calculations and, and they found that if we have a carbon nanotube, which is a single wall carbon nanotube, and when we apply an electric field, so this is some arbitrary unit electrical field that they're applying, then what happens that this, this if you look at any of these uh, you know, uh, uh, rings, then essentially we can see that here the charges are very little and this is kind of random, but when we look here, then essentially we can start to see that the, the, this starts to get little polarized. So charges actually starts to build up on this carbon nanotube ring. So it's no longer, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 it has now some sort of polarity. And not just that, but you can also see that there's a change in the dimension of the sample, right? That is visible here itself, and that can also be seen by the by the dimensions or the or the lengths of these various links, as opposed to how it was when we begin with. So now there is a there is a there is a strain that happens when we apply an electric field. Now this is their explanation. We this is for one carbon nanotube, and as you apply electric field, you can see the bond elongations. But look at these fields. These are huge fields. This is volt per angstrom. So we are looking at ten to the power ten, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of volts per meter. So this is huge uh, electric fields that we are looking at. So what we did was in our lab, we, we thought it, okay, let's, this is something that has been shown for a carbon nanotube, a single wall carbon nanotubes. Uh, what will happen if we just do this multi-wall carbon nanotubes, the ensemble that I showed you to foam, and how does it, uh, what happens, you know, in this case, when we apply electric field. So we build this simple setup. This is your carbon nanotube, and we are actually applying a potential on the top and the bottom, and we are measuring the displacement or how much strain, how much elongation that is going to happen uh, using some displacement sen sensors, which happens to be a laser-based uh, uh, sensor. And we apply voltage from minus, minus five volts to plus five volts to see what is what is the case. Now, again, look at please these numbers. This is actually, uh, you know, 5,000 volts per meter as opposed to here, uh, which goes into 10 to the power 10 uh, uh, volts per meter. So this is a very small volt uh, applied electric field. And there, this is what we see. We see that this is, as we apply the electric field, there's a large amount of actuation that we see. And the actuation is symmetric. It doesn't depend on the polarity, right? So that's why it is not piezoelectric. It's actually electrorestriction based technique, this best method. And we did this experiment without any electrolyte. So this is just in plain air, right? Huge uh, strain of the more than actually 12% 12, 12 strain that we get just by applying actually, you know, actually four kilovolts per meter. To give you a number, if the sample is about one millimeter thick, then we are looking at about four volts, right, across that thickness. So this is this is not very high uh, voltage. This is available in our mobile phones about this kind of voltages, uh, you know. And 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 again, if you see this picture, uh, this this behavior, then this behavior can be very nicely uh, represented by this simple equation, which is a parabolic equation. Uh, equation. So this is something which is consistent with the uh, electro restriction mechanisms. And then we looked at, you know, in a, in a, in a pulsed uh, voltage, what happens? How does this uh, actuation rise and decrease? And you can see that there is a lag between the, uh, between the stimulus and the response. 
and which we can easily uh, write it in terms of the simple equations, which is actually coming from the uh, you know the the way we look at the capacitance getting charged and discharged. Uh, and this makes sense because you know as the theoretical studies have shown that when you apply the electric field, which actually generates some polarity, and and that essentially involves charging and discharging mechanism. The time constants, if you measure for the charging and discharging or rising up and falling down, uh, comes out to be same, about 8 plus minus 1 second. That tells that it's the same, same mechanism or the same uh, uh, processes are involved while charging and discharging, which happens to be the, just the charge. Then this is something that we saw without any mechanical load, but then we wanted to see what happens when we apply the mechanical load. To do that, we built a small fixture where essentially we can apply an electric field and we can then, uh, you know, across the sample and while we are applying the mechanical load. And this is what we see. This is very interesting result in that sense. So this, this, this actually is very obvious, very little bit clearer in uh, when we apply an electric field of about 1.82 kilovolts per meter, which is actually your red curve here. So this is where we actually applied the electric field. As soon as we apply the electric field, you can see there is a sudden jump in the amount of the force or the amount of the stress that we need to apply to maintain that strength, right? And as soon as we switch off that voltage, then essentially it goes back. It goes back to the original uh, strength as if this, this, there is no memory of what happened here. So, so we can actually make this material stronger, am I right, if we apply an electric field. That's what this graph, this experiment, simple experiment shows. And then we wanted to understand that what is happening there. And then again, we went back to uh, you know, theoretical studies that people had published. And one of the uh, papers uh, uh, that was again published long ago, what they had shown is that if we, this is electric field and this is kind of dipole moment that you generate because of the polarity in the carbon nanotubes. And what they have see, shown is that if we just apply uh, no mechanical load, it's just a static one, then essentially we see that as electric field increases, the dipole moment increases and that increase is actually uh, linear. Whereas when we apply an electric uh, mechanical load, then essentially this polarization actually happens much rapidly, which can be represented more as a as a as a as a parabolic as a as a as a as a quadratic equation. And this happens because with, with a mechanical load, there is a there is a redistribution of the of, of the charges in the in 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 the or, or reconfiguration of the bands that is there in the carbon nanotubes. This this was explained very well in this theoretical paper. So we took that uh, cue from there and we thought it okay the polarizability, polarizability is no longer linear. And hence, when we apply the electric field, uh, we want to measure the strain, then that is simply given by this polarizability into the mechanic in the electric field. That's a simple equation, how much the pole will, will, will extend or what force will be applied in the pole, in a dipole is proportional to the electric field. And the polarizability itself is going to be a quadratic equation. Then hence, we are looking at a cubic equation here. And then we did a simple maths and we figured out that Indeed, that is the case what we are seeing in our in our in our samples. So, because we are uh, applying a mechanical load, essentially we are getting more than what kind of strain we were getting uh, when we just do the uh, do this uh, actuation without any without any mechanical load. So, so upon, upon application of mechanical load, essentially we get more more effect. Uh, more more uh, the properties are actually much much more advantageous in that in, in that case. Then it was simple. We wanted to see what can we do with this. So one thing that comes very, very easy in mind is that what if I just put this simple thing on a on a piece of paper? I'm sorry, a piece of any component, any any system, and I drop it, right? Or I I, I want to apply a mechanical load, and I want to see if if my structure will will be protected against those loads or not. So so that's that becomes our because that was one of our our things that we were looking at. And so, so one of the things that we want to see in those, those exercises is that when something hits something, right, then how much energy it can absorb, right? More energy it absorbs, that means, you know, you have been able to, uh, you know, remove the impact of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of the load. Like all that energy has not gone to the structure that you are protecting. Some of that energy is actually taken by the protector itself, which happens to be carbon and tube forms here in this, in this particular example. To evaluate that, how much is that energy that it can absorb, we did this simple experiments where essentially we loaded the foam in without mechanical load. Whereas we when sorry, in, in the in presence of electrical uh, field, and when we unloaded it, 
uh, we just switched off the we switch off the power. And you can clearly see here uh, when we load it with one volt, and unloading is is a zero volt. You see the size of this curve becomes bigger, right? And that size of that curve, that hysteresis loop, is actually the amount of energy this 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 foam have absorbed, and and that actually goes very strongly. It is a very strong function of the electric field that we apply. So by application of this electric field, actually we can absorb a large amount of energy. We can protect our structure much better. And and why it happens is you see can you can see from these pictures when we load with and unload without electric field, you can see that the structure that you have, the carbon nanotube uh, strands that we have is fairly buckled here. And because of this buckling, it takes out, takes out all the energy. When, whereas when we unload it with the electric field, then essentially we see that all of these things are actually standing straight and they are not buckling as they don't buckle, they don't crumble, they don't take the energy uh, from, the, from the system. So, so, so this, is, this is interesting. Then the question is that, okay, if it works, by the way, these this experiments, we did it at some strain rate or some loading rate. What will happen if there is a really an impact in the sense that, let's say, if I drop my mobile phone from, from a height, that we are looking at very high loading rates. So to confirm that, we, we had to build a setup where essentially the carbon nanotube sample is here in this one, in this small glass uh, thing. And then we, in this glass, glass tower, we drop a ball. I'm right on the carbon nanotube. So we get very high strain rates, which resembles what will happen if you drop your mobile phone from, 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 from a height of about four feet or four, 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 or four or four to five feet. And then we wanted to see what will happen when we apply electric field, how this shock absorption is going to increase. And this is a picture that we could take from the, our high speed camera. You can see that the ball is falling, am I right? And after it falls, it hits the sample and then it rebounds back, right? It goes up and then again, it will fall back. So this thing produces this kind of a signal in the load cell, right? So every peak is one impact. So if I measure the difference between these peak heights, right? Then I essentially understand that what is a loss in the potential energy of the ball. And that means that much of energy is absorbed by, 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 our, uh, by our structure, which happens to be carbon nanotube form here. And, and then second thing is that how, this is also related in some sense to how much time does it take for the ball to again hit back, because if the ball is falling from a long distance, a large distance, it will take longer time as opposed to if the ball is falling from a shorter distance. So based on this, we can actually think of an energy cap energy absorbed equation, which is actually this equation, right? How much energy is absorbed is can be can be given by this equation, which is just a function of the mass of the ball, right? Gravitational acceleration. What is the height of from where we drop the ball, and how much time did it take? Uh, in between these two uh, peaks. So this is a simple mechanism, how this is working. So this is the ball falling on, this is the contact. At the contact, the forces start to increase. This is the maximum and the velocity becomes zero. And then again, it goes, goes up, am I right? And this is an interesting picture, what happens, what we see when we have electric field and we don't have electric field. So this is the case when we don't have electric field, we can see this is the drop. This is the, there is a, certainly there's a loss of energy because of the carbon nanotube itself. It's a form of structure that itself can take energy. And this is the case when we are actually applying the electric field, right? So the electric field switches off as soon as the force becomes maximum. Uh, and, and this is, again, you can see the time, how much it is changing and how much, you know, the peak loads have decreased. And there's a clear advantage, as you can see from these two, the time distance, time interval between the two uh, drops is actually much smaller here. That means the ball didn't rise that, 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 that top, right? That 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 much. It 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 rose only up to that shorter distance, and hence this time taken for the second impact is less. And the peak again, you can see accordingly becomes uh, much smaller here. This is the second peak divided by the first peak. So smaller the number, more energy it has appeared. And this is a trend that we can see: more the voltage, more is the uh, less is the time between the two uh, impacts. So that means even at a higher rates. Uh, you know, it is absorbing a large, large amount of energy. Uh, so at lower rate as well as higher rate, it absorbs energy. This is the voltage and how much, you know, uh, how much energy it can absorb. Again, we can see that we apply more voltage, it can absorb more energy. And right now look at these voltages. These voltages are not that high. These are actually small voltages about, you know, one volt, five volt kind of voltages, which is easily available in, in, in our, most of our devices, right? So the, so the plan is that can we then 
take this material and really use it uh, in 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 protecting uh, you know the, uh, the the protecting the uh, uh, small items small equipments uh, because uh, that that may be a, a possibility so with that i will summarize my talk and i i hope that you are not so much late for your lunch uh, you know electric field as you can see here uh, in, induces very large actuation in the carbon nanotube forms, am I right? And, uh, you know, there's not, uh, there's a little degradation, not much degradation. Uh, electric field enhances short-term strengthening of carbon nanotube forest, as we saw that. Uh, in, in, electric, in the presence of electric field, the, the same material behaves as if it is much stronger, am I right? And it also, uh, you know, enhances the amount of energy that it can absorb, am I right? So, we can get high strength and high toughness, which is actually good for uh, any engineering application where energy absorption or protection of a component against, you know, drop or against any impact is important. So with that, I will, I, I, I thank you all for your uh, patience and listening to me. Yeah. If you have any questions, please do ask. Thank you, sir. There is one question from our uh, audience that where in your chat box. Okay, uh, I will. I will just yes, yes. I can see the. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, you see, the uh, steel is uh, is is very strong material, right? Uh, 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 okay, let me let me dissect this problem a little bit more. So so the thing is, when we compare, you know, you'll always hear this thing that carbon nanotube is stronger than you know steel is all these things. But when they are talking about that statement, when the carbon nanotube gives you higher strength, uh, you know, to to you know, uh, if they are talking about one single carbon nanotube, okay, single wall carbon nanotubes or multi wall carbon nanotubes. So when we compare that one carbon nanotube with steel, then 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 the carbon nanotube is strong. What we are talking about is actually a group of these carbon nanotubes, ensemble of these carbon nanotubes, right? And they are taking the load in compression, right? If you take the carbon nanotube, one carbon nanotube, it cannot take any load in compression. Right? It's like a rope. It will just coil down, it will just go down. It can give you the strength only in tension. Here we are looking at an ensemble. It can compress, in, it can take load even in compression. It, it, stay, it kind of like keeps a standing because everything is helping each other to stand. So when we compare these carbon, carbon nanotube foams that I was talking about with the steel, then this is, this is, this is not that strong. This is a very weak, actually, it's significantly much, much weaker than steel. I'm right. And, and from that point of view, the carbon nanotube forms are no, nowhere closer to, to the kind of energy that, that or kind of strength that carbon nanotube that steel will show. Okay. Uh, but, but when we are looking at one strand of carbon nanotube, then, then that is stronger than steel. So, so we have to, uh, and that also intense. Okay. That also intense, not in compressed. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. I mean. This we conclude the fourth technical session of today. On behalf of the Orlando College, I would like to thank all the resource persons present for this session of the International Seminar. It is a matter for pride for all of us to have people of great importance and caliber with us as people. And I would also like to thank all the participants for engaging patiently and taking the session more interactive. We have a lunch for all the participants and uh, of our uh, seminar behind the uh, botany lab. So please proceed for the lunch. And the next technical session. It starts at 3 p.m. and it's in the seminar hall. Mm -hmm. Thank you.